assalamu alaikum and greetings from karachi thank you so much for being here with us uh, our virtual audience again at the fourth of the virtual lecture series i'm most grateful to zero carbon admin team for ziyasat khan salman malik and umar iqbal for your diligent efforts to continue to organize this activity this is the fourth one we are having quite regularly i would like to welcome today's eminent panelists professor pervez wandel as has been uh, said quite eloquently by fozia the pillar of our profession and a distinguished academic who has taught and mentored generations of architects he brings with him a vast knowledge of dealing with issues of culture and crafts which he has pursued so forcefully with his wife and my friend professor sajida wandel herself a great mentor and then our amazing james green a young architect with a heart with his passion for heritage conservation and excellence in the promotion of crafts he is also a great favorite of mine along with his fiance my friend harriet wenberg i will forever be grateful for to, for james in our invaluable contribution when setting up the ateliers for green skills and crafts at the zero carbon campus at makli thank you parvez and james for your wonderful contributions to the intibao pakistan november conference held at zc3 at makli which made the discourse meaningful and rewarding thanks again for being with us here today so while my last lecture was devoted to barefoot social architecture or bazaar's focus on drawing sustenance from heritage and tradition for richness and depth today i would like to share with you the two remaining tenets that underscore the value of training and knowledge sharing for fulfillment for fulfilling unmet needs of the vast majority as well as the role of non engineered structures in shrinking the eco footprint Throughout these discussions, my intent is to share with you my endeavors in fashioning strategies for healing the planet, while serving the displaced and the marginalized. As you are aware, the utilization of sustainable green materials has been critical for my work. But really, it is the weaving of the tenets of social and ecological justice that lend authenticity and integrity to our conceptions. The materials are but the, the tools. it is the incorporation of compassion and humanism in our designs that endow them with lasting value this is certainly true when designing humanitarian architecture when the poor or the displaced are our clients i do consider that when it, when we work in humanitarian architecture it's people are the ones who we're building for they are our clients but i believe equally true when we design for the affluent and the privileged the values of empathy consideration and benevolence will be in great demand as we begin to deal with economic downturns in the aftermath of covid-19 we know that even earlier we expected shortfall in achieving sdgs or sustainable development goals there are 17 of them as you know in which developing countries were in any case expected to lag behind the scenario offers even a bleaker picture today the ray of hope is that governments such as pakistan may now be forced to make greater investments in buildings for the social sector and for provision of public good which will require either humanism to be an integral part of architecture and hopefully architects will you know join that and and begin working on that so um oh so now my, my slides are starting now so let's see now as you see the title is um, social barefoot uh, architecture is part 3 and 4 of it and uh uh let's see so um So my offerings today are the con continuation of my journey as I struggled on the one hand to grasp the vagaries of climate change as Pakistan experienced one calamity after another and on the other in the search for strategies for bringing about social change with minimum funds some of you might remember my dictum low cost zero carbon and zero 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 cost which I have been talking about and uh, uh, this calls for delivery of well designed products by the impoverished for the use of the other poor what i tell them is that whatever they do they don't have to worry about selling them to either the urbanites or to the privileged but that this these products are being made for others who are exactly in the same boat as they are it was the award winning pakistan chula store that led the way now the the, the person who's really uh, the one who made it happen is champa here you see being given an award at, by the governor uh, sin at the governor house and uh, uh this is the uh, pakistan chula barefoot entrepreneur or be i think this uh, can run as a as a video if uh, uh if it can that would be nice because then you can see champa 
um, talking about what she does. I don't know whether the sound is missing or, but anyhow, there she is. And uh, she's sitting in the house that she's made and the chula that she has made. And uh, she's talking about how uh, in 2017, by that time she'd earned about 28 lakhs of rupees. She had a motorbike and she had, a, you know, she got a house and she had got her children married and she had lots of jewelry. And then by 2019, her earnings had come, gone up to about 60 lakhs. And that's about 125,000 rupees per month that she was able to earn by serving poor rural housewives with a life-changing low-cost product that was the chula. The Champa model validated the adage of social entrepreneur guru, the founder of Ashoka, Bill Dayton, and I quote, social entrepreneurs are not content just to give a fish, but teach how to fish. They will not rest until they have revolutionized the fishing industry, unquote. In the case of over 60,000 Pakistan chula stoves that have been built to date, while we had provided rigorous training and marketing strategies to our bees, that's the barefoot entrepreneurs, it was the creation of an eminently desirable product which provided women with dignity and respect within their highly conservative societies that they lived in. Now, like others of my generation at college, I'd hardly been taught any other subjects except the fundamentals required for the practice of architectural profession. So where I have economists in my family, my daughter Raina did her master's at Chicago Business School, and my husband Sohel read modern grades at Oxford. Sadly, my own college education was highly deficient as far as the study of liberal arts was concerned. So it was only a few years ago, while trying to understand the nexus of poverty and inequality, that I stumbled across two figures whose writings resonated with my own sentiments. One was the French economist Thomas Piketty, the author of the bestseller, Capital in 21st Century, and his findings that today's soaring inequalities are an outcome of the present world order and accumulation of wealth by only 1%. The other is Chilean economist Manfred Max Neef, who under his barefoot economics promotes human scale development and fulfillment of unmet needs. His list of multiple poverties include, as you can see, the whole list of poverty of subsistence, of protection, of affection, of uh, you know, understanding, of participation, and of identity. So there are lots of poverties that so many people in the world actually suffer from. So reading Piketty, it was clear how easy it was to be swayed by the desire to gain patronage of the 1% because of their wealth, and just as easily to overlook the inequality suffered by the majority and mostly by POP or bottom of the pyramid that remained behind the veil. It was a combination of these readings and the groundwork by our stove sisters such as Champa that fueled my dream. I needed to devise a structure which would create millionaires out of beggars. At the same time, bring about social and ecological well-being within impoverished communities. To achieve my dream, I would have to foster a, a host of barefoot enterprises and an army of barefoot entrepreneurs, which would target untapped markets within the barefoot ecosystem, aiming at the gaps that exist in public services due to corruption and poor governance in countries such as ours. This understanding led me to formulate the Barefoot Incubator for Social Good and Environmental Sustainability, BISCES, with the aim to revolutionize Bill Dayton's fishing industry, or in our case, the barefoot ecosystem. The incubator is designed to provide training in green skills and crafts, along with a mechanism for monitoring and mentoring, based on the same system as incubators for technology, with the difference that our incubator aims at social good as well as preventing damage to the Earth's resources. Now, while BISCES is valuable for the humanitarian ecosystem, as it leads to empowerment and self-reliance, I offer it as a methodology that could be equally utilized by those who dream of an equitable world. So just to very quickly describe it, the step one, of course, is to identify the enterprises, and they are mostly the unmet needs that we find among the poor. The second is the selection of about 200 to 300 persons who are largely non-literate and non-skilled because they are the ones who become incubatees. And the third step would be rigorous training a workshop over five to six days. We normally hold them at ZC3, uh, comprising specially devised training modules, graphics, videos, et cetera. And step four would be provision of outreach through mentoring of incubatees and monitoring of production activities. And of course, the last step is to try to secure angel funding and help to find marketing avenues. So to test this barefoot model, I decided to choose Muckley's mendicant communities 
that I've discussed earlier in, as well, the ones that I showed you, where we were able to gain entry fairly easily in other rural areas of Pakistan, the entry into beggar villages had been extremely arduous. It took us several months of persuasion until in 2017, we managed to make a breakthrough with one single beggar woman. Karima joined us to fabricate miniature clay styles and market them from where she used to beg. By the end of 2018, we had gained considerable credibility by investing into rights-based development for 500 families carried out on a participatory basis. It costs us only rupees 25,000 per family to provide structure for a safe home, water and echo bathrooms on sharing basis and lime for making Pakistan chula. The experiment had given rich dividends to co-building and co-creation because it was always on a participatory basis. They also had to contribute which transformed their own environment and brought purpose in the lives of our mendicants. Now for this purpose, as I mentioned, the zero carbon campus was available for use for incubator training, which you see on the left, uh, you see the map and the, the middle um, drawing shows uh, where the ZC3 is. Uh, it was, which is eminently suitable for lectures and assemblies. Now this had been built close to Makli villages to provide trainings for artisans, as well as for holding cultural events and conferences. Now, uh, ZC3 had been designed as a venue to help bridge uh, the divide between the impoverished and the privileged. You can see in this slide of ZC3, the top are craft pavilions on the left, uh, mostly used by women, while the bottom picture shows delegates of, at the Heritage International Conference held in 2018. The slides on the top show university students attending zero carbon workshops, and the images below are of trainings for barefoot and, uh, enterprises from Makli villages. I just wanted to show you the setting where all this is going on. So uh, from 2000, January 2019, a project titled Green Skills and Crafts for Livelihoods was conducted with support from British Council DICE program in the University of Glasgow. In addition to rigorous training, it provided mentoring and monitoring for 12 months in eight villages, specializing in diverse green enterprises. The incubators were drawn from among the most enthusiastic beggar communities consisting of over 50% women and 21% suffering from various disabilities. And specially designed workplaces were built in each village. As you can see, um, village one village is only construction techniques, which are you know very mud and lime and bamboo uh, products. And village two is Chula. Number three has mother, uh, mother Earth products, while number four has bamboo. Uh, village five uh, deals with Kashi and Terracotta. Six number is barefoot hospitality program for for really the spiritual tourism that it goes on in Makli, and then village seven and eight are food security. So each village actually specializes uh, in, in 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 one kind of products. Now uh, the next slide will show that the graphic representation of various activities when at work in different villages. It's a little bit yeah there it is. Uh, it's just a sample for you so you can see the portraits of all trainees from each village. Uh, and as I said, there are 230 of them which were rigorously provided with all kinds of help and assistance and training. And they've been the most wonderful uh, uh, learners from the point of view of, of enthusiasm and, and wanting to go ahead. Uh, and this kind of belies any kind of, uh, uh, you know, ideas you might have about beggars. They are all ready to take on work which will give them dignity. So then the next slide will show you how the slide, uh, the products are made um, as, as samples. Um, if we can go to the next one, um, you can see um, on the left, uh, they're making these prefabricated uh, or prefab uh, pre panels of straw, which are then very easily put on roofs and the brick making and also the lime brick making and so on. And another slide will show you that the Mother Earth product and how they are being, being produced. The idea was to show you the kind of work that's going on and how it is possible to train people in very simple things which can be really beneficial to them. For instance, if there's mother earth products like the organic soap, then it's very inexpensive and you know people can actually you know wash hands uh, rather than trying to say that they should buy uh, you know more famous brands. So um, uh, then there's another slide which will show you that the kind of products that have been made by each village. Uh, uh, this is a kind of a, if you like, a catalog of, of uh, the products. So you can see the construction village has earth, lime, brick, and thatch panels, Chula village is Chula making, and so on. So each village, as I said, specializes in one kind of product. And the last two are to do with food security. And I have to say that many of them are doing extremely well, even uh, within the lockdown situation. 
So when surveys were conducted just before the lockdown, we found that 70% of the original 230 had risen above the poverty line. And my latest news is that even during lockdown, something like 90 of these people are actually able to earn something like between 6,000 to about 12,000 rupees per month in spite of the lockdown because everything is being produced locally within the villages and they are also marketing it, it uh, locally. So that is, uh, that's good news from the point of view of, of my barefoot model. Now, um, talking about the venues for workshops, you know, because of our work and our proximity with Makli World Heritage in the next slide, you'll see that, because um, uh, I like to slip in, uh, well, you know, heritage somewhere, and here it is, the tomb of Manuel Makuri that we are conserving uh, these days, which has amazing, amazing Kashi or glaze style work. And uh, this is where we've been conducting our, our uh, trainings and our workshops about ground cleaning and scientific cleaning of masonry, lime pointing, and, uh, all, and uh, other activities according to highly developed SOPs. On the right, you see the zero carbon campus, uh, the artisan ateliers at the zero carbon campus, where you can see that the pavilions, uh, and if you see from the top, the lime and earth pavilion going anti-clockwise, the bamboo and the mother earth and Kashi and Terracotta and the Pakistan Chula station in the middle. So this is how these were all laid out uh, at the time of the November conference. Now, I just wanted to show you the banners that we placed in the next slide at pavilions at artisans ateliers uh, to do with the log process, the Chula, green atelier, Kashi and Terracotta, and so on and so on. And uh, to provide sequence of op op operations and the products that are being fabricated. Uh, so this is how they were so that people would know what is it that can be done in each one of them. And then I thought I'd just show you some uh, a slide of participants at the log construction uh, at the time of the November conference uh, and how everybody was so interested and took part uh, so enthusiastically with everything. Uh, that was quite quite something actually. And in the next slide, uh, we can see that availability of the ateliers with training facilities provides the opportunity for eminent guests to rub shoulders with our barefoot entrepreneurs and artisan settings such as these have value for the introduction of sustainable materials along with developing an understanding of crafts. So there are some of the videos and maybe if this, we can run this video, it's in the bamboo atelier. Um, if uh, the video could run, it just a, I brought only a few for you so that you get an idea as to how these things are being done. These are artisans who are um, showing what could be done, people are watching, but then in between some took part in actual cutting and, and jointing as well. Um, and what was very interesting was that a lot of our uh, guests, eminent guests actually took over and also explained many things to one another. And, uh, and that, that I thought was something that we not foreseen, but it added so much value to everything that was going on. Uh, are we moving forward? Yes, okay. So uh, here they are showing how things are put together. And, um, and as we'll see, there's some who are, there were participants who came and, you know, the delegates who came and did. And here's James as well, as you can see, because James actually oversaw a lot of the bamboo work that was being done. So um, this is uh, only one of the videos and then, uh, Perhaps as we go to the next one, uh, there is uh, John Darlington who heads the uh, World Monuments Fund in London, and it, it, we don't have the sound, but he, he he made the best break actually there. It's a it's a mud break, and he really was excellent in in in, in making it. Uh, and the next uh, slide, uh, next next video, uh, you can see. Unfortunately, the sound I, I can't hear the sound. There is a uh, quite interesting conversation that is going on along it. Here you will see um, our uh, ex chairman P. K. P. Sikander. There's some sound coming, yeah. And he, he took a whole bunch of students and he uh, conducted the whole workshop there actually, showing them how to use the plum, how to, uh, what should be done with the brick, and so on. And, um, and also, I think there was also, as a Swali, he also, uh, chart where he is uh, talking to the artisans and also explaining to students how things are to be done. So I do not expect that everybody who will participate will begin working for the poor and the marginalized, but I do think that interaction of this kind can lead to greater understanding about alternative ways of practicing architecture. And that would be really interesting if we somehow you know, had a whole network of such places where students and others could join hands and be working on all kinds of uh, 
crafts and particularly the green skills that are so important and relevant. So the last tenant of Vasa showcases uh, that I'm now going to be talking about is the non-engineered structures for shrinking carbon footprint of buildings. Uh, now, as the world is confronted with one disaster after another, engineered structures are offered as the panacea for post-disaster development for undertaking enormous building activity. Thus, high carbon emissions are inflicted on the world in the name of safe post-disaster reconstruction in areas where low ecological footprint was the norm, such as Pakistan's picturesque north, which has been ruined due to hundreds and thousands of engineered cement concrete structures in the aftermath of 2005 earthquake, that were a result of international aid. Having worked in the humanitarian field for 15 years, I believe that Western charity model and international aid paradigm require revisiting. Because charity, although in good faith, fosters dependency and robs the receiver of self-respect. And then international cluster system and lack of knowledge inhibits sustainable rehabilitation. Promotion of alien imagery and expensive materials are culturally and environmentally highly damaging as you can see uh, in, in this report. Women are invariably left behind even though worse sufferers during disasters. And high administrative cost of disbursement of aid allows only a fraction to reach affected households. And that is the reason why I feel that we have to go in for those systems where we require very little money, which will really rely uh, on the people themselves rather than treating them as victims, use them as a resource and something that they can really learn to do and work with. So um, the next slide will show you the urbanized engineered structures that were actually promoted, have been promoted uh, quite vigorously by uh, international aid systems. On the left, uh, you can see the two uh, models. One is, um, uh, one is burnt brick and the other one is made out of concrete, uh, RCC frame and, and, and uh, infill with, with concrete block. And uh, um, there's this gentleman by the name of Magnus Wolf Murray, who's advisor to DPID, and he worked out that if you were to use uh, five, you know, if you were to build 100,000 uh, 100, one room shelters after the flood in 2010, then you would really denude 50,770 acres uh, of forest. Uh, this is the order of destruction that will happen if we continue to use burn brick, because actually speaking, um, the lime brick that we make is equally. Uh, strong, it's equally um, uh, workable, um, uh, and there is no need really to use uh, the burn brick. And the same is true, of course, uh, for the concrete, uh, concrete structures and the concrete blocks. So um, next slide, then we see the environmental impact of construction, of the normal construction. And I don't know how many of architects have actually seen these kind of figures, but you can see that 40 to 50% of world energy is used in building industry. 16% of world's water usage and 3 billion tons of raw material is generated. 15 to 20% uh, of waste stream is generated and 3 billion tons of raw material that is used. Now the energy requirement also you can see is quite horrendous for steel and Portland cement, which is up to 1800 C for steel and, and 1550 centigrade for Portland cement. So um, then I thought I'll show you, um, uh, of course I've shown them earlier as well, but this particular model which does not require any of uh, that kind of energy consumption, uh, costs only about 20,000 to 25,000 rupees per unit and uh, um, became the world's largest zero carbon footprint program uh, in the world. Uh, we did it as you know, a partnership with IOM and there were no carbon emissions. There were no trees fell, 1,750 villages were, were covered, 300,000 persons were housed. And what we used was only locally sourced clay, low energy lime and renewable bamboo. So I just wanted to show you this as a contrast. And then um, I thought I'll also show you the, which is the, the last kind of uh, uh, design that I will, I will present to you, which is for earthquake uh, resistance, but actually became earthquake proof. So uh, for, uh, for those who might be interested in working in disaster areas uh, for, for uh, making buildings um, uh, you know, seismic uh, resistant, we have to follow certain principles, which is that everything should be tied together. That's the one basic principle. But when you're using mud, then again, uh, we had to use bamboo lattice to increase mud's low material ductility and low compressive strength to prevent collapse. So that's been used. And connectivity of walls has to be assured through use of corner L-shaped bamboo lattices that we'll show you again in, a, in an animation that I have. And the use of 
bamboo reinforced lime concrete ring beams and anchoring roof elements into masonry walls. So this is basically the, the basic principles under which we design such buildings. In the next one, you can see the sequence of insertion of bamboo lattice, uh, which is actually an animation. Uh, if you can just work on that. Uh, of course, you make the foundation that you usually do, uh, which is all, also uh, lime concrete. And you start building in this bamboo lattice at, at, at so many courses uh, also throughout the wall construction. And the, the, you, you, again, uh, you have the uh, bamboo reinforced lime concrete ring beam. And then uh, again, on top of it, you, you have your uh, roof structure. But before that, you also put these bamboo lattices on the inside and outside, which are carefully all tied together. So the slide shows the sequence of insertion of bamboo lattice within earth masonry and tying of it. And the, this particular structure was first designed for, uh, for Avaran earthquake in 2013. And I'm grateful to our distinguished civil engineer, Amin Tariq, whose help was crucial in the early days in developing non-engineered structures along with implementation of our team of artisans led by project manager Nahim Shah, supported by our architects at Karachi. And then um, I'll show you the shaking table test, uh, but first the protocol for the shape, shaking table test. Uh, and, you know, most organizations were not able to accept this, the fact that only earth and bamboo can produce something that will be seismic resistant. So we said, okay, let's get it tested at the at, at a shaking table test. And that's how we arrived at NED University of Karachi, uh, which is, as you know, is, is prestigious and very well known. So it was conducted there and uh, the model was scaled down to 50% of actual size. It was subjected sequentially to ground motions uh, corresponding to Kobe earthquake of 7.3 Richter scale. Levels first applied was 25%, 50, 75, and 100%, but there was no damage. Then from 125 onwards to 275% without appreciable damage, even when 175% over and above Kobe earthquake, and then subjected to extremely high acceleration history of up to 670% in an attempt to make the model collapse. The walls were damaged, but collapse did not occur, indicating life safety performance under any eventuality. And uh, this would be my last slide, which is the shaking table test. So if I, maybe we can just run that. Uh, and maybe if you can have some sound with it, that might be nice also, actually. So you can see 200%. Is it too, is it too high? So, uh, and you can see, I think the sound might just, it, it adds a little bit drama to the thing. So it's probably quite nice if we can have it. But now we're going up beyond 100%. This is not 275%. And you can see that um, it's, a, it's really, you know, it's moving uh, together, but it's not collapsing. And then Mr. Sarosh Lodi, the engineer, the vice chancellor, uh, he was president and he said, we've got, to, we've got to break it somehow. We can't, you know, have it not collapsing. And so that's how it went to 670% un until they found that the movement was so much that their reinforced concrete buildings might begin to uh, suffer damage. So uh, they had to stop at 670%. And this is what you see after 670% that there was no uh, collapse of the walls. So um, uh, you can see that uh, there could be no, um, uh, no casualties and that's what's important for buildings. It's, it's not, as they say, it's not the earthquakes that kill people, it's the building, the structures that kill people. So we have to devise structures that will be safe for everybody to live in whenever we know what kind of a disaster we might be uh, coming through. So now these offerings are in the way of drawing attention to the fundamental role of design and the need for architects to be in the forefront of innovations for lowering the carbon footprint. You might need prolific inventiveness to respond. I hope with excitement and creative imagination to issues and challenges that we will all be confronted with once we wake up from this lockdown. In the next lecture on the 13th, we will discuss another avenue that is wide open for architects and that would be heritage and, uh, and um, in, the, in the aftermath of COVID-19. And the last lecture, uh, which will be on the 20th, is planned to discuss the pointers towards architecture and urbanism in post-COVID-19 world. So what was it that Vincent van Gogh said? I dream my painting and I paint my dream. Thank you so much for your patience.